So um, I'm here to talk to you today about a, a project um, we undertook at Starlab, um, resurrecting the Zen blanket. Uh, so I'm Christopher Clark. I'm a software engineer consultant. This is my co-presenter. Hi, I'm Kelly. I work at Starlab, and I worked on the uh, IARPA Virtue project for this. So we've got two sections to talk today. The first one is about uh, the technical gore of, of building a, a capability, uh, and the second part is about actually what, what it looks like to actually use that capability. So the thing that we set out to do was to enable um, movement of virtual machines uh, between clouds, around clouds, without necessarily having any cooperation from the cloud provider. Um, and without necessarily tying the uh, software that we were running to the particular uh, cloud provider's uh, platform. So um, the, the requirements for this were that we are uh, to support running unmodified guest virtual machines, so using the existing set of uh, device drivers within the, uh, the guest OS, and to not require modifying the uh, cloud platform itself. So the plan uh, for enabling this agility between clouds is actually to, to use Zen's own uh, live migration uh, and insert an instance of Zen itself into the cloud provider instances. Uh, and once we you know, enabled that within an individual instance, you can uh, assemble a collection of these and, and build your own uh, overlay cloud uh, on, on top of whatever resources you've commanded to, to do this. So um, in, in a little more gory detail, we, we're looking at uh, inserting uh, Zen into a HVM uh, Zen cloud instance uh, and then running guests on top of that. Now, one of the, the constraints with uh, a number of cloud uh, instances is that they don't actually provide you uh, the CPU virtualization capability. Uh, so no VTX or AMD SVM. So that, that narrows the uh, constraints a little. You're looking at running PV guests. Uh, so, you know, Linux was actually the, the, the deployment target, which is, uh, so, so PV is fine for our, uh, for our purposes. Um, and then by, there's a few different a couple of different bonuses that came from uh, the technique that we're using. By, by inserting Zen underneath your VM inside your VM instance, uh, you, get, you get a benefit of being able to run uh, virtual machine introspection yourself on your own workload within your cloud VM without any support from the cloud provider for that. You can customize your instance of Zen to enable whatever you know, features you need without actually needing the cloud provider to offer those to you. Um, and if you want to, you can actually run multiple virtual machines inside your cloud provider's virtual machine instance, which is not a thing that you necessarily normally want to do, but if you, for example, if you're deploying unikernels, um, if you've got one unikernel and you go and rent yourself a, a cloud provider VM, you'll be billed for the whole instance, which may not be well sized for your tiny little unikernel. Um, so this is a technique you can use to assemble your collection of unikernels inside a cloud provider VM without renting many VMs at a time. Um, okay. So uh, with this diagram, this is hopefully uh, pretty basic for everybody here in the room. This is uh, a typical Zen system architecture. We've got uh, a couple of different guests. Uh, I've got DOM0 running Linux with the standard Zen daemons, tool stacks, and the uh, device backends that support the virtual devices in the front end, and it's all running on top of you know a standard Zen hypervisor. Um, so this is what it looks like when you nest and add an additional hypervisor uh, to the box here. Uh, you know, you still in, within your guests, you're running your standard. Uh, PV device drivers, front end, back end, connected to the, uh, the, the back ends in your DOM0, 
Um, but in, in, in this instance, in, instead of having, with the, with the previous slide, you had your physical network and storage device driver. But, but in this one, you, you're trying to connect to your cloud provider's virtual devices. So you've got a, a PV block front and a PV net front to get access to those. And uh, you hope that the whole system works. Um, so what happens when you try to do this? Um, so if you uh, get yourself a Ubuntu VM or whatever on your, on your cloud and you, you go and install your standard Zen packages for the hypervisor and, and tools as you would on a, a local machine, um, the, it'll, it'll go pull the packages down from the repositories, uh, install them, and then you'll get this you know, thing saying, yes, that was fine, and then you, you reboot your VM. Um, and when it comes up again, all your PV devices have stopped working. Um, you have, you've, uh, you, depending on the cloud provider, you, you, you might come up in uh, running on the emulated devices because you're running inside a HVM instance. Um, but your network configuration may be different because it may not have the same MAC address. Um, and generally, it's, it's not actually what you asked it to do. So, the, the, the issue is, and, and this has you know, been known for a long time, is that um, you, you've made a transition from running a standard Linux VM to running a, a DOM zero, and, and they don't run with the same level of privilege. Um, your, 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 your what is now a DOM zero uh, is running in, in ring one as a, as a, as a PV guest. Uh, your, Zen hypervisor that you've just inserted is running at, at ring zero, um, and the cloud provider's uh, uh, Zen instance is, is not going to respect the authority of the, of the hyper calls that your device drivers are, are making because they're running, from, they're executing from the wrong privilege level. So um, that, that's problem number one. Problem number two is that the the Zen instance that you've inserted may well have a different set of address. Uh, translation mappings than the cloud provider instance. It doesn't have to, you know, you, you, you've now got memory virtualization as a, an additional layer. So if there's any references uh, to particular addresses from your device drivers, it's not necessarily the case that, you know, they'll match what the cloud provider uh, hypervisor is expecting. Um, so the, the solution to this was, you know, the pro this problem was described uh, in 2012. Uh, at this Eurosys paper by some uh, chaps from IBM and Cornell University. Um, and, and they developed a, a piece of software to, um, to try and address this. Um, but it was never, at least uh, I'm unable to find a, an instance of it being presented to the Zen community. Um, and it, the feature was never integrated into Zen, uh, and there's no equivalent. Um, but it, was deployed, I don't know if it still is, um, but the project pages are still live, uh, at, at, you know, like a private cloud running at Cornell. Uh, and there's code available from the original effort uh, on, on uh, a couple of different repositories on Google and GitHub. Um, anyway, so this is the origin of the, the name Zen Blanket. Uh, it's not, not our choice. Um, I think it's to do with, you know, a blanket is something you throw over something else in order to solve a problem that you have, um, being cold or not getting your hypercool serviced. Um, so th this is the structure that uh, was, was presented in the, in, in the Zen Blanket uh, paper and project. Um, you, you're running uh, Zen as a guest within a HVM guest. You make modifications to the upper level hypervisor, which is the one that you provide. Uh, and you make uh, some modifications to your DOM0 kernel to add a secondary set of device drivers to leverage the modifications in your uh, L1 Zen, uh, which will then proxy the hypercores down to the, to the cloud uh, for you. Uh, and that enables you to run PV guests within that instance. So um, what, what we did at Starlab was we, we re-implemented that architecture uh, with the modern version of Zen and a, a modern version of Linux, uh, which is, you know, in, initially a, a, a pretty aggressive forward port, uh, followed by a, 
a full re-implementation, at least of the, of the Zen piece. Um, yeah, so we, so we posted patches to the, uh, to the mailing list for uh, Zen on Stable, and we've got a, an equivalent version for, for Zen 4.12, and there's a, a modified um, Linux uh, kernel that you know, matches uh, available on GitHub. So this, this is the, the structure that you end up with once you've deployed this. You've got um, uh, modified PVNet and PV uh, block uh, front drivers inside your DOM0 that talk to the cloud. Uh, you've got modifications inside the Zen that you provide, uh, which enables the kernel to request the Zen L1 to make hypercalls for it down to the L0, and that enables the plumbing for the uh, PV net and PV block drivers. Um, but you can also, at the same time, run your existing PV net back and PV block back to provide service to your uh, guest VMs that you're running inside your instance. So you've got a little Zen world of your own inside uh, your cloud VM. I guess I just described this. Um, yeah, so the, 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 the major modifications are, are all to the uh, items in your DOM0. You don't have to modify your guest VMs at all. Uh, and so it, it, it's, it's not, um, if, if you consider your guest VMs to be the, your users, your users are not exposed to the fact that you've made any changes at all. So in order to implement the changes inside Zen to make this work, uh, we added uh, six new hypercalls, which are very, very similarly named and related to the uh, existing set of hypercalls. These are basically all, all that is needed in order to get the, the drivers to be able to proxy through the Zen uh, to the cloud provider's hypervisor. Um, it, it's not very, it, it, six hypercalls is a, is a pretty bold proposition to add in one go. Um, but they're not actually uh, very detailed, and, and really what they're doing is uh, permission checks, um, argument formatting, and invocate, invoking a, another hypercall to pass it down to the bottom. And, and it's not even, if you were to look at the non-nested versions of these hypercalls, um, these nested versions are, are much, much less code, and not even the full set of operations for each of these hypercores that they're mirroring. Uh, it, it, it's a subset. Um, in, in addition to implementing the, the hypercores, this, we added uh, XSM Flask integration, which was not present in the original Zen Blanket work, um, which means that you can uh, provide your own uh, XSM policy to your L1 Zen uh, to uh, hand out permissions as, as you need to. The, the default set just you know, assumes that it's only your DOM0 that wants to make use of these hypercalls, but if, if you want to uh, widen it for a disaggregated architecture, uh, you've got the option to do that. Um, there's a, there's a, uh, probably the, the biggest part of the XSM work was um, the XSM existing code for uh, writing policy about event channels uh, reasons about the either end of the connection um, to form a compound label. But in the nested scenario, you don't actually know the label of your remote uh, endpoint to that connection. Um, so the XSM policy for the nested event case is a little bit different uh, than the non-nested case. Um, so after uh, forward porting and implementing this code, um, it, it became quite evident that in, in modern Zen, there's a, a very similar piece of uh, code, the, the PV shim, which was introduced um, to mitigate the meltdown uh, uh, issue. Uh, so you, you'll see the shim used uh, when you're running PV guests inside a HVM cloud instance. Um, and it looks very similar. But the, 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 the hypercalls that are involved are, are almost exactly the same, uh, not necessarily all of the same operations for each hypercall needs proxying for this versus for the shim. 
uh, the, the shim also doesn't have a requirement for implementing uh, XSM controls because you know it, it's just wrapping a VM. If you're going to use XSM, you're going to be using it on the outer hypervisor. Um, so there's a, there's a slight difference in the code bases there, um, and then there's some minor quirks, just implementation stuff that um, the, the shim disables SMAP in order to issue a particular hypercall, whereas the, the blanket code uh, doesn't. Um, I'm not sure why the shim needs to do that, but anyway. Um, so there we go. I think at this point I shall hand over to Kelly. So with Chris Clark's work, we needed to be able to use this in the IARPA Virtue program. Virtue is virtuous user environment, which pretty much has the goal to develop a cloud-based user environment with a focus on security and usability. But for the security, we wanted these nested guest domains. Um, so our implementation was to use Zen Blanket on EC2 instances for guest domain management. So this is the architecture we ended up with um, for the Virtue program. We have the um, layer zero, DOM zero, as the AWS EC2 instances. And then we had layer one, which was the Zen Blanket DOM zero on the instances. And then we had the guest domains in PV mode um, on the instances. Now the uh, DOM zero on the instance was Ubuntu, that's what we used. And then we were able to test the guest domains with both Ubuntu and CentOS. So with this, we had a few added security features. One of them was introspection, which allowed us to view you know, the kernel modules running processes and the guest domain LSM um, live while the guest domains were running. And that way we could trigger different yeah, security protocols based off of what we were seeing during introspection, uh, which provided that security component of um, the case study. So the other big feature was migration, which we used quite a lot, um, which pretty much gave us the ability to transfer a guest domain from one EC2 instance to another with very little downtime. Um, so little that we actually have some demos. If I can reach it. <laughs> Let me. So during this, so our virtue environment has pretty much executed a migration. So you, you, you see the virtue Firefox 123 under the top um, JSON list. Uh, that's what we call a Valor, which is the DOM zero. The virtue is the guest domain. So we've executed it due to our system. It takes about a minute to actually fully complete the migration, but that's because we have a lot of overhead in the, let's say, where this virtue is. Um, but you can see the ping times going through, and it should migrate any second now, and you'll see it actually jump to the bottom one. And so the ping times stayed pretty consistent. Um, and then we can also, oh, well, that's just, and then in action. So this is going to be using a text file or writing a text file during the process, so it's again running migration. You'll see the same thing happen on the left. Um, a virtue is migrated to another Valor, which means a guest domain is migrated to another DOM zero. Um, so this was just me typing away while I was waiting for the migration to happen. Um, but we use this pretty extensively in our virtue environment. We even were able to set up a timer so that every, say, 10 minutes, all the virtues were migrated to another Valor, or all the guest domains were migrated to another um, DOM zero. And there you go. Oh. 
Okay. This works. It's not working. Okay. Okay. Uh, so that's uh, pretty much what we came here to show you. As far as the, the next steps for this, uh, we've got, there's a talk immediately following this one on uh, nested uh, PV devices or PV devices for nested systems. Uh, so uh, if you're interested in this, I'd, I'd recommend you attend the next one too. Um, we're hoping to have a bit of a discussion as to what, what the right interface is for uh, PV drivers in nested systems. Um, we've posted ours to the list, but we're, we're interested in the capability. Uh, so it'd be interesting to get some feedback on what the, uh, what the interface should be. Um, and yeah, we're, we're uh, looking forward to having Zen uh, enabled as a, as a first class cloud workload. Um, and here's a few links to some uh, related materials from the project. Yeah, so the Virtue um, project that I was talking about where we were able to do this timed migration and everything is now open sourced at the first link if you're interested, and then a description of the project is at the second. So. Yeah. All right, so questions, I'm gonna, I don't know who came first, so I'm gonna. So, um, maybe I missed it, but you must have had to do something to Linux to get it to be happy with two Zen stores. Was that hard work? Um, the, the Linux uh, modifications were more invasive than the Zen modifications, yes. Um, but uh, the, the main modifications to Linux were cloning the sets of PV drivers. They didn't have to modify Zen store uh, itself, as far as I remember. Um, so it's the standard set of Zen tools and daemons running in DOM0. If there were any modifications, it would be the DOM0 Linux kernel. Um, and I'd have to go and look, but I, I can't remember making a specific change to it. You, you cloned the drivers, meaning you just made a copy of the source code and changed all the names. That's right, yes. Right, it's not okay. <laughs> That, but, but to be fair, right, there, there's uh, other work being done. There's a patch series posted by an Oracle engineer recently on Zendevel um, for enabling the same uh, driver code to run as two separate instances, but one to handle each level of the, the nesting. So, um, yeah, it, the, the Linux code that we have today is probably not what you want, which is why we're not intending to upstream it, but other people are working on that. Excellent. Thank you. I was just wondering, when we did the shim, we added some PV alignments to Zen itself. So for example, you can use the PV timers and some other PV interfaces. Are you also using that for the L1 Zen? So uh, basically, are you using the emulated uh, timers from HVM, or are you using the PV ones from L0? That's a good question. I think, so there's, there's a couple of different versions of this code, and I think in the most recent one, which was the port to 412 and, and unstable, um, really tried to minimize the modifications we made. So I think we're probably um, piggybacking on what was done for the shim. Uh, so whatever the shim has in there, if that's PV timers, I think that's uh, exactly what the blanket code's using as well. Uh, was there anyone more on this side? I didn't see any other hands, so. So this is an awesome work, by the way. So I looked at it in the past, and it was very difficult to, to solve this problem. I'm glad somebody uh, took it on. So the first question I have is, um, do these new set of hypercalls are, are, are able to support more than one level of nesting? So can you do N level of nesting, or is just basically hard coded to one level of nesting? It was, it was just solved the problem for one level of nesting. You know, we, we, we went straight for how do we unblock the use case that we have? Yeah. Uh, so, yeah. Okay, the, the other question is, so if I recall correctly, so the L0 Xen will block or refuse any request from uh, L1 DOM0 of any hypercalls. 
so basically everything uh, and I guess absolutely everything is proxied through L1 Xen, right? That's right. Uh, so is it, do you, I mean in your measurement, does it look too slow or is it perfectly acceptable? How's it, how does it turn out? Uh, it, it's usable, right? Um, the uh, performance requirements were for interactive um, use. So we're running you know, VMs in the cloud, and if you're running a, an interactive you know, sort of desktop VM in the cloud, you're already accepting you know, the variability of cloud providers, infrastructure, and performance levels there. Um, so that's, that's the extent to, to which we, we tested the performance. Yeah, so with the, the yeah. dev domains, um, the virtues, we actually had to, we had Docker containers on the guest domain, so there's an added amount um, of craziness there. And we were actually able to play YouTube videos um, with no lag um, and demonstrate that. And we were also able to edit using things like gedit and had no perceptible lag. Um, so the actual Zen components of it were very usable. Okay, nice to hear. So one suggestion, maybe, I, obviously we cannot rely on changes to L0 exam, but maybe we can lay down the groundwork and fix that check that would prevent the zero from, I don't know, or improve the check to allow the zero L1 to make hypercools directly, maybe. But anyway. No. <laughs> Not possible. All right, so I, I'm afraid we're out of time and we have to um, consider, you know, the next talk, so. Questions um, will stay with my talk, but um, I'm addressing some of them. So maybe a combined question session afterwards would be more useful. Okay. Thank you.